making movies about systems, not gunshots. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, we'll talk with one of the directors of the documentary, Whose Streets. As the news cameras left Ferguson, Missouri, after the police killing of Michael Brown, Sabah Folayan and her team stayed on to document what happens to people subjected to police violence as a matter of routine. That's coming up, plus an F word from me on surveillance. If you're not outraged, you're not paying attention, and if you are, well, the feds know about it. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. After the killing of Michael Brown by police officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri, the documentary Whose Streets takes us back to Ferguson in the days and weeks following that event. Beyond the uprising and the clampdown, the killings and the protest, Whose Streets takes viewers into the personal lives of the activists on the ground. They're young people with young families. The documentary ends up being a lot about love in a community cornered by an increasingly militarized police. Whose Streets is co-directed by Sabah Folayan and Damon Davis. It's just now being released by Magnolia Pictures, and I am very pleased to welcome Sabah to the studio. Glad to have you. Thank you. Remind us where you were when the news broke of what had happened to Michael Brown. Um, <clears throat> when I first heard, I was at work. I was on my computer, and I started to see this information come through Twitter. And I saw the photograph of him on the ground, and I saw the tweets of people who were out there. And you were in New York, right? Yes, I was here in New York. I was at a nonprofit um, doing reentry work, so I was helping them to kind of understand how their organization was working with incarcerated people. And um, I, I heard about it through social media, and it was just really triggering. And then I started to see people taking to the streets, and I started to see the militarization. And it felt like a story that I somehow knew, even though I had never experienced anything like it. Now, you quote, you, you, you quote I think it's Dr. King, a riot is the language of the unheard. In a way, that beginning montage of your film, I couldn't help thinking sort of YouTube is the Hollywood of the unreported. Um, a lot of those images, I don't think most people had seen before, right? Yeah, I think the media was really focused on the, the looting, the rioting, the, you know, what was shiny and, and would get ratings, and people weren't really paying attention to what was actually happening to this community. So how long did it take for you to get to Missouri? Um, I was there about a month after Mike Brown was killed. My job ended. Um, my DP, who was a friend of mine from college, we decided to go down there together and just see how we could kind of support. So we were doing a bit of community service and documenting what we saw. Um, I actually wanted to do a public health study. I was a pre-med student at the time as well. And I wanted to show that people facing off with police was going to have a traumatic effect on this community. You couldn't really do that kind of research in that environment, and I learned that really quickly. <laughs> so we just started rolling and asking questions. But you did decide very much to focus on families and the effect on families. I was struck. I mean, maybe I had missed how young everybody was. What ages are the, are the people that you focus on most? Brittany, Farrell, just to name one. Um, Brittany is, I believe at the time this was happening, she was 26. Um, David is a bit older, about 30, but um, very, very young people with young families. And has you got to know them? Was there a moment where you had to decide, like, where do I put the personal in this political story? Where do I put the activist in this police story? How you do the balance? Yeah, that was tough. So we started out before the, you know, about a year ago, actually, in August. We had a 90-minute cut of the film, and there was none of the protests, none of the news footage. It was only people and their families. Mm. And there were seven different people that we had followed in depth, and so each of them kind of had a moment in the film. And it was just about teasing out the cause and effect relationships between what was going on in the streets and what was happening inside of people's homes. So that must have been torturous, getting rid of five people's stories. 
Yeah, it was really tough. And we never wanted to tell this as a kind of messiah story. That's not about one hero that comes and galvanizes everyone. It really was always meant to be about a community of ordinary people coming together. Now we'll get back to more of the community part and the, the love stories, which I really came across really strongly. But you also do a lot of reporting. I mean, there are facts in the story that come out in your film that I don't think are widely known. One, at the very beginning, your character David, who's involved in Cop Watch, points out that there were cameras on the street, on the scene where the killing happened, where Darren Wilson killed Michael Brown. Have we ever seen that footage? I have not been able to get access to that footage, um, but actually a good friend of mine, Lyric Cabral, who made a wonderful documentary called Terror, um, is working on another film and um, about the, the community and what actually happened more on that day. And he also makes a point, David makes the point in the film, that the police policy after the announcement of the non-indictment went down um, was very suspicious as well. Tell us about that. Um, it was, you know, the, the night of the non-indictment, it was very, very eerie. There was this buildup in the weeks and days leading up to it where you could just feel in the air that it was coming down any day, and every everyone would just be asking each other, what do you think it's going to be? What's going to happen? When is it going to happen? And so the can just kept getting kicked down the road, and finally, it's at, you know in the middle of the night, this announcement drops, and no one knew this unified command, no one knew kind of where they came from. And people were whispering about, you know, there being this sort of all call put out to police across Missouri to just come and be a part of this, this force. And so that night, you know, they're just these men in black and you don't really see any name tags or shields and there's no one you can talk to or ask any questions of or anything. Like people sort of just came ready for battle and no one ever really did get an answer to the question of kind of where does the buck stop. And yet all the looting was kind of allowed to happen. Yeah, at the same time, and it's sort of this thing where as soon as the police sort of arrive on the scene, people get agitated. What would have been a rally and people just sort of gathering becomes a confrontation when the police arrive or they'll be there and then they'll escalate. And so, you know, what I saw was police sort of escalating and then pulling back. And once that energy is ignited, people, you know, people are frustrated, people are upset. There's this sort of group catharsis that happens out there that I think is beyond anyone's control. It's sort of bigger than any strategic conversation about protest tactics. I think it's something that happens when you have people in a powder keg like that. And particularly on the black and poor sides of town is where you saw police kind of pull back and let that energy just get released. I mean, heck, we've seen that mob mentality in football stadiums and at sports games, so right. we all know how that works. Um, but it was striking what people said, and it was striking the degree to which those activists on the ground were conscious and aware of exactly what was happening, even as it was happening, and they couldn't really stop it. What was the most, what was, what was the thing you were most surprised by as you started trying to cover the story or covering it from the inside out? Clearly you know something about the issues, you're working on um, re-entry after incarceration, post-med, pre-med, um, but still, I bet you were shocked by some things that had been represented differently. I, I don't think I, ha I knew the extent of the systemic issues in St. Louis and, you know, really, Learning from St. Louis taught me a lot about what's going right and wrong around the country, but particularly in that city and particularly in the parts of town that are occupied by black people because they have a long history of you know, very intense segregation. You know, the housing is falling apart, the education is falling apart, the city is divided into 91 municipalities. So Ferguson is six miles wide and there are 91 of these. And so, you know, just the sheer bureaucracy that people are facing in order to try to make change. It's 91 different police departments that would have to change to effectively you know, change the quality of life for people in this region. And so I think I just didn't understand how deep these tendrils go and how sort of intertwined people's daily life and our sort of status quo is with these seemingly isolated cases of police brutality. So let's talk, we talk a lot on this program about alternative models of things. Like how could we do things differently? If we don't like the way things are happening now, how could we do them in a different kind of way? Speaking as a filmmaker now, what have you learned about how we can tell these systemic stories? Because it's easy to capture violence in the streets, you know? And once that picture's out there, it becomes the story, which is maybe why they let all that looting happen. 
it's hard to tell these systemic, long arc of history narratives. Tell us a bit about your approach. We'll show some clips. And then what's your lesson, maybe, for, for other reporters, journalists, particularly people that maybe don't have a year to make a doc? You know, I think to answer the second part of your question first, I think as far as format, all of these different types of media are necessary. And it was necessary for someone to respond immediately. Right. Um, it was necessary for people to have that information. I may have wished they had a different lens on it. Um, but I don't think that documentary will ever replace the news or vice versa. Um, so I just recommend, and in both situations, I recommend that people take a holistic approach. Um, in general, to life, to problem solving, not looking at what's happening in politics as this is politics and this is separate from what's happening in education and separate from what goes inside my home, but really looking at these things as interconnected, I think can allow us to you know, talk about issues that may seem dry, like fines and ticketing. Sometimes it feels like what happens in our daily life is totally disconnected from these ideas and there's a compartment for our social justice. But social justice shouldn't be something that you do when you go on Facebook. It should be something that is embedded in your lived experience. So I think looking at things holistically rather than siloed is a way kind of into a more realistic and tangible approach. Remind people of what the fines and ticketing story was as it pertained to St. Louis. So a big reason why this, um, this movement spread in St. Louis was because of this long practice of police targeting people with fines and tickets. So the, everyone we spoke to when we first got there would talk about how you can't drive from the city to the county without getting stopped. Every single person was completely paranoid of getting stopped. And so I think when, when the police came out and responded this way to Michael Brown, and he was stopped for, you know, supposedly stopped for walking in the middle of the street, this tiny infraction, Everybody had an experience. Mm -hmm. I've been harassed for some tiny infraction. And so it was a big part of what galvanized this group of people to come out. But and it was the way the police department was making money, the way the city was, the right. town was making money, right. right? On these escalating fines as people were unable to pay the first one and it just got bigger. Mm -hmm. And the same went for housing fines, people for not mowing their lawns, for having their trash cans in the wrong place. So you're taking people who are already poor, taking what little money they may have, and also incarcerating people when they can't pay these fines. So this is very unconstitutional. And the DOJ report came out and showed that this was happening in Ferguson and you know other municipalities in St. Louis. But I think without having this kind of flashpoint and seeing viscerally how this can affect a family, you don't understand why small time tickets are a really important issue. Yeah. So going back to the, fam the families, there's a beautiful moment where two of the characters that you follow get married, two women have a, a wedding and they come out chanting revolutionary love, love, love. And you feel like you're, this isn't at the end of the movie. It's not even in the middle. It's quite near the beginning of the movie. You're, you're, you're making a point. Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, that's one of my favorite scenes, and I'm really happy that we got to show that. And it, you know, we had questions about it. Does it belong in this film? Does it feel out of place? But it's it's kind of bleak. It's a bleak proposition a little bit to go out and face off with your own government, you know, with nothing but your hands and a sign. And we wanted to show where people were getting this courage from, where people were finding this strength and this power to try to even believe they could do this. And love was such a huge part of it. And, and people connecting with one another in ways that they had been taught that they couldn't or shouldn't and coming together. And we felt like this relationship was sort of the crystallization of that idea. She said, if you're not questioning normal, you're not normal or something. You're not, yeah, you're not paying attention. <laughs> you're not paying attention. Um, Let's show a clip from the film. The clip that we're going to show actually features those two women um, standing down the police, outside the police department. Do you want to say anything more about it? Yeah, so this was actually a really incredible night because it was like a little mini victory for the movement. It was the first night where the police sort of allowed people to occupy the street. They had been out on the sidewalk and doing this kind of back and forth with police for about 52 days at this point. So this was the 52nd day of protest and the police finally let them, you know, just occupy the streets. And Here's a clip from Whose Streets?
going down on your watch. But treat us like humans and not like animals. Don't beat us like dogs when you do arrest us. I ain't let none of y'all. I ain't let none of y'all. Let's fast forward to the end. We will continue to fight for our rights. We will continue to fight for our rights. When Britney, the movie continues, the film continues, you see Brittany get arrested for something. I won't tell the whole story of the entire film. People can check it out. But she comes out changed, you feel. Um, talk about her. What happened to her what, in the course of this film? And do you know what happened to her while she was detained by the police? Um, well, fortunately, she, she wasn't detained for very long. I think she may have stayed overnight. Um, but I think in that moment, you know, she made a choice when she went out there that she was going to see that action through. But I think when those consequences actually came, you know, it, it put things in perspective. And she had so much on the line. And she consciously and willingly put it on the line. But it doesn't make it any easier um, when you have to face those consequences. And I just have so much admiration for her and the way that she's still, even in that moment, she's still looking out for the people around her and making sure people are okay. And I actually got arrested in that same action. And I remember she called me the next day and she's checking on me, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Are you okay? And she's facing a felony at this point. Um, so I think it just, you know, it was really a point for her character where her sense of self-preservation and her care for her community, I think we're really, really at odds. And it, it was hard after that. It was hard dealing with this case, and it was very political. They very much wanted to make an example of her. And um, you know, luckily, she ended up being acquitted, and she doesn't have to you know, do any time or anything like that. But and she's bringing her daughter into the movement, too, and she talks about that as well. Here's another clip, Who's Streets. Can I, she was six when the movement first started. Day one, she was with me. There were a lot of questions about why we were out there, and it was my opportunity to educate her on how things have never been right for black folks in America, and this is just another example of that, and this is what we have to do. I dropped out of school for a whole semester, I set my graduation date back six months. So many opportunities were lined up. My professional network was large. Soon as something happens and I feel like my community is at war, I'm like, to hell with all of that. None of that matters for me anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fine. I don't want to kiss. Get out. Nope. <laughs> Get your backpack. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Get out. Love you. Have a good day. Five words. I have to go do something. Go. I'll come see you today at lunchtime. Lunch. Enjoy. Have a good day. I want her to think for herself, to resist and participate in democracy. That is your right and they cannot be taken away from you. So the young people that these activists are raising, they describe as their future. Um, they also talk about a new movement, a movement that isn't, I think as Tefpo, the, the rapper puts it, not your daddy's civil rights movement. How does that look to you now? Um, if you were making a sequel, what, what, would, what story would it track? I think we're learning. Um, I think that, that quote, I'm not your, it's not your daddy's civil rights movement, I think it's you know, many layered. I think it speaks to the fact that the torch has sort of been passed by a lot of those older leaders who have taught us what they know. Um, I think it also speaks to the fact that the stakes are a little bit different from us. I think our predecessors proved that black people could be dignified and sophisticated and you know, that we were respectable. And then we learned that that wasn't 
that still wasn't enough for us to be guaranteed the human rights that we want. And so we are kind of facing a more human rights struggle and a struggle for recognition on a more philosophical level in a way. Um, and I think, you know, part of that looks like defining for ourselves what is our generation's purpose and what, what are, you know, what are our legacies going to be. Um, a lot of people that I know are dealing with anxiety and dealing with self-care. And I think millennials get this reputation for being kind of spoiled and soft and self-centered, but in reality, there's kind of a built-in trauma, built-in PTSD to being a black person, to being an oppressed person in a lot of ways. That harm and that toxicity is where a lot of these abuse, you know, a lot of abuse comes from, a lot of the negative things that, that we're facing that can justify the systemic injustices against us or just cripple our movements in general, make it difficult for us to work together. A lot of those things start with not taking care of ourselves. I think it's great that we've identified that. I don't know what the next chapter is, but I think that you know it's a start for us to be really interrogating ourselves and figuring out how to be okay. Have you learned, has Ferguson taught lessons about how we actually keep communities safe? Well, I think that, you know, it also harks back to that scene where Brittany is arrested, but I think there's an interesting conversation happening about what does it look like for white people to be involved in anti-racist struggle. And um, someone asked me the other day, you know, what does white allyship look like? And I said, I don't really believe in allyship because if it's true that we're one people and, you know, just before this was all happening, it was I don't see color, then when that kid gets shot on the street, then you should be able to imagine that that's your son or your brother. There shouldn't be my fight and your fight. And so I think that... I'm not in solidarity with you, I'm with you. Right, right, we're all in this. And so I think that, and I've started to see around the country different groups of white organizers recognizing that. But I think that if we are going to pull back from you know, really severe conflict, the police have shown that when it's black bodies and black issues, they are willing to escalate immediately. And I don't know that that's the same case if white people were to come out en masse. So we really need for people to participate. And I think, you know, I think some of the measures that we can take are simple as far as general strikes, as far as coming out into the streets, but it's about can we get on the same page and can people who don't see themselves as having a stake in this recognize that we actually all have a stake in this. Have you been cheered by the responses to the Charlottesville right uprising? Absolutely, I have. Um, I think that a lot of people have, have come off the sidelines because of that. A lot of white people have taken responsibility to say that we need to go back to our communities. Um, and I've seen a lot of people actually stepping down in situations where they don't feel like their institutions are upholding the right values. And I think that's really, really huge. Sabah Folion, thank you so much. Congratulations on the film, thank Whose so Streets. Much. Check it out, people. You can find more information about the film and all our coverage of Ferguson at our website. Thanks for watching. To target activists in the 1970s, U.S. intelligence agencies conducted so much illegal surveillance that they generated one of the biggest scandals in U.S. history. Forty years on, we're watching documentaries about the Vietnam War while our government conducts surveillance ops that put anything from that era to shame. The only thing Americans do less now than then is protest. So why is that? The U.S. Department of Homeland Security announced recently that it will be collecting more data on more people starting October 18th. Alongside everything else they already track, the DHS will gather social media information, Twitter handles, Facebook accounts, Instagram pictures, search records, viewing history, calling history, and they'll keep it. DHS and its immigration unit ICE will only be targeting immigrants, they say, but they actually include everyone not born a citizen, and anyone who interacts with those people. So that scoops up me and I bet you. In the 1970s, the FBI and CIA et al. said that their targets were just domestic terrorists and foreign radicals. It turned out they actually went after civil rights leaders, feminists, journalists, and anyone who knew those people. Federal agents tracked and listened in on and did their best to drive mad everyone from actress Jane Fonda and columnist Art Buchwald to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Muhammad Ali. 
Democrats at the time held hearings, gathered evidence, and concluded that a long, shocking list of people's privacy rights had been violated. Among those, the right to assemble, the right to speak, the right to associate, and the right to communicate. Today, we do all those things online. So where's the hue and cry about privacy? There's good reason to suspect, I think, that the expanded net is as much about handing out multi-million dollar contracts to military contractors as protecting anyone from anything, like terrorism. But to go back to 1975, enough people then got angry that Congress demanded new, tighter controls on surveillance. Today, we're barely hearing a murmur, and mostly about the privacy rights of legal immigrants, so-called, and citizens. We should know better than to go down that dangerous them, not us road. If our predecessors had done more, more quickly, we might not even be here now. But at least, did I mention, it was a scandal. What's at stake aren't your rights or mine or theirs, but rather democracy. The Laura Flanders Show recently released a series of short videos about digital security. You can find out what you can do to secure your phones and your social networks at our website. That's lauraflanders.com. And write to me. Tell me what you think. That's L-A-U-R-A -A at lauraflanders.com. And thanks.